the Lord President, the past presiding bishop, Bishop Siwa, the General Secretary, Reverend Hensrod, bishops and the lay leaders of synods, unit leaders, members of the Connectional Executive who are joining us on Zoom and those present here. Methodist people, wherever you are, the congregation at large, I greet you all in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. First, I must thank the choir, Reverend Mabuza, the organist, for giving us this feel of worship, which we, some of us have missed for some months. And it feels now like we are still alive. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, to the minister here, Reverend Long, before opening this church for us. Thank you so much. I welcome everybody to this service, which marks the official opening of the 2020 CE meeting. This year, as it has been said, has been filled with unprecedented events. We had a plan to hold the Connectional Executive and Conference in Kimberley, Mukala Muntle Synod. That plan was disrupted, conference had to be suspended, and so we meet in these next two days as Connectional Executive that is mandated to deal with some essential business of conference. Today it is day 189 of lockdown in South Africa. It is proper as we start to acknowledge that COVID-19 has touched all of us in different ways. Some of us have been infected by the virus and they know exactly what it does to the body. But in spite of that, they recovered. Some others have lost their loved ones to the virus. They've gone through the trauma of COVID-19 funerals, where you don't see your loved one for the last time. As a church, we have lost members and clergy to it. But as worshippers of God, God of all comfort, in the words of St. Paul, we comfort each other with the comfort that we ourselves receive from God. And so even now and today as we meet physically and virtually, we meet as Wesleyans, so we can say in Charles Wesley's words, and are we yet alive, and see each other's face. Glory and praise to Jesus for his redeeming grace. And Charles continues, what troubles have we seen? What conflicts have we passed? Fightings without and fears within since we assembled last. Year 2020 started well for the connection, the MCSA. We started with excitement of the inauguration of three new synods. The Synod of Namibia, of Moloko, and Kamdibu. We had plans 
to celebrate 50 year anniversaries of some of our synods. We had plans to celebrate 200 years of the arrival of Reverend William Shaw in the Eastern Cape. While we were looking forward to these events, then came COVID and disrupted all our plans. It has thrown the, world, the whole world into a time of crisis and turmoil. Recently, we've been told over a million deaths have happened in the world through this virus. The people of the world, the continent, and our connection are facing the challenges of the destruction caused by this pandemic. The church, like all sectors of society, has been hugely disrupted. Since March, as a connection, we have lived under various regulations that limit gatherings, which disrupted our worship life and ministry as we know it. While these regulations are being relaxed, particularly in South Africa, the virus remains among us and as dangerous as always. According to the scientists, it will take something like two to three years to find the vaccine. It therefore remains everybody's responsibility to prevent the spread of the virus and to ensure that lives are saved. As churches reopen, I must emphasize that strict adherence to lockdown regulations must be adhered to. Thank you, Nubant. <clears throat> At this point, I want to thank all the Methodist clergy and all in the leadership of societies, circuits, and organizations at all levels. In spite of the restrictions on coming together to worship, ministers and preachers and leaders of organizations have creatively found ways to minister and send messages of the gospel to our members through Zoom, Facebook, WhatsApp, email, etc. Daily devotions, sermons, services, announcements, etc. continued within the connection. These innovative ways of ministering to our people have kept us together in spirit as people called Methodists. We are also grateful to ecumenical bodies for keeping us together guiding and supporting the churches in different countries of our connection. At a connectional level, must thank our communications director, Bongi, who has relayed information and kept us in touch with what has been happening. While we are doing our best, we need to acknowledge that like the whole world, COVID-19 has put us as a church in a state of shift and a state of transformation. Now the theme that I put before the Methodist people, this conference going forward is guided by God's mission, reimagining healing and transformation. When I was given an opportunity to address conference last year, I declared that the MCSA does not need a new vision statement. I affirmed the last year's theme that called us to sharpen our effectiveness as a church as we walk humbly with God. I was and I'm even now convinced that the vision of a Christ-healed Africa remains relevant. COVID-19 has been a light bearer, 
shining a shining light into the multiple pandemics that are destroying the world, and in particular, the continent of Africa. <coughs> to highlight a few, COVID-19 has resurrected and shone the light on the pandemic of global racism. It has shined the light on a worldwide cry from women as they are abused and killed. It has shown the light on the degradation and abuse of the earth and depletion of natural resources, the violence imposed on children and young people through inequality of education systems and the inhumane ways in which their bodies are physically and sexually abused. We see wars and conflicts that displace people and turn them into unwanted refugees. The dehumanization of the queer human beings, the unequal access to health care facilities and medicine, unequal access to basic needs like shelter, water, food, etc. We see the growing trend of self-serving leaders of governments, leaders of private sector and politicians, the rising levels of poverty, hunger and un unemployment, the socioeconomic divide is ever widening as the poor are getting poorer. Suffering and pain abounds in the world and in Africa. So while we long have been proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ for healing and transformation, the vision of a Christ-healed Africa is far from being realized. However, as a church and individual Christians, we cannot lose hope or be discouraged by what we see. While it is natural to be disoriented and stay behind locked doors, like the first disciples after the crucifixion of Christ, we cannot forget who we are. As the Father has sent me, said Jesus, I am sending you. And so as Christ's church, we are the sent ones, sent to partner with God in God's mission, the mission to redeem and transform all creation. As a church, some time ago, we took a resolution as one of our transforming goals, and the resolution was we make a resolve to be guided by God's mission. Even at this time, when sands are shifting and the world is covered with fear, mental and physical sickness, death and hopelessness, we dare not let anything guide us but God's mission. There is no doubt that God is at work healing and transforming the world, even in the midst of the suffering that we see and experience. While guided by God's mission, I hear God calling us to reimagine. I hear this call as I read the familiar story of Ezekiel's vision of fresh and life-giving water that flows from the temple. Now Ezekiel was a priest prophet who had served in the temple as a priest, concerned with the inside of the temple, concerned with the rituals and ceremonies of the temple, until he was exiled when Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem and exiled Jews to Babylon. <clears throat> it was when in exile that God called him to be a prophet and speak on behalf of God. Through God's messages and visions that Ezekiel received, 
He encouraged his fellow exiles who were discouraged and depressed by having to live in a strange land. We know the words of their lament. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange world? Ezekiel called, was called for a time like that to speak on behalf of God. In this vision, Ezekiel is brought to the entrance of the temple, outside the temple, as though God is saying to Ezekiel, you will not see what I'm doing if you remain within the temple. Get outside and then you will see what I am doing. Now, as he stands outside the temple, he is shown life-giving water flowing from under the, te the temple. As it flows, it becomes deeper and deeper until it becomes a river that no one could cross. He is then led to the bank of this river to see the great number of trees on both sides of the river with fruit to eat and leaves to heal. He sees the river flowing down the desert of Araba until it gets to the Sea of Araba, which is called the Dead Sea. And when it gets to the Dead Sea, it dilutes the salty water that kills and it turns it into fresh water where fish multiply and provide food for fishermen and provide livelihood for fishermen. What an image of hope for the exiles. The water that poured out from under God's house represented the unrestricted flow of God's blessing to the people of God. The message to the exiles was, don't give up on God. Out of God's throne flows all that gives life. And when God intervenes, there will be abundance. Now, all of us, friends, at one time or another, we come to a desert place, a dry space of the soul, where nothing seems to be going right, where God seems to be silent. Our faith at those times starts to shrivel up and to shrink. And we begin to be self-serving. We begin to care more about self and we forget the mission of God. It has been pointed out that with COVID-19, there is a rise of mental illness and fatigue because all of us are concerned. What about me? What about my children? What about my parents? It's all about us as though our livelihood and our lives are in our heads. Our lives and our livelihoods are in God's hand. We as followers of Christ, of course, are not immune to these fears and these doubts that come with difficult times. It is at these times, friends, when we need to go deeper and deeper in our relationship with Christ. It is 
relationship with God that hands over everything to God that can lead us to this space where Ezekiel was, the space of being able to see what is not happening but what is going to come, the space where we are able to, to, to stand up and say, we will do what we can in order for the kingdom of God to be fulfilled because we know that our God is at work. And he calls us to be partners with him in the work that he's doing in the world. It is from that deep faith that we become agents of hope who continue to bring hope, reimagining and envisioning the reign of God in the world. It is the faith that is able to look beyond what is in front of us and see what will come when God intervenes. Now, what is this reimagination that we are talking about? <clears throat> in a book, Chasing Social Justice, Laurie Shermans defines reimagination as, I quote, a theological concept that stems from the belief that the world is fallen and that the mission of God through Christ is to reconcile humanity and the whole cre creation to God's self. This work of God of reconciling all creation flows through the followers of Christ, the church, and into the world. Reimagining for the church means allowing the picture of the reconciled world to propel their actions, end quote. As in the vision of Ezekiel, God's life-giving water coming from the temple comes through the actions and words that become embodied in our life together as a church and in interaction with the world around us. Reimagining is the ability to see beyond the here and now through active listening to the Holy Spirit and to be open to the changing times and to what God is saying to the changing world. The definition of the, way, of the word as expounded by Merriam-Webster Dictionary is to reimagine is to imagine again or to imagine anew. It is to form a new conception, to rethink or to redefine. Reimagining implies change, evaluating and shifting parameters of concept and perceptions, and even completely renaming outcomes. To reimagine healing and transformation, therefore, calls upon us to look again at what it means for us to proclaim the gospel for healing and transformation. It calls us to have this picture of healing as we work at what is not healed yet. It means we join the reimagining tradition of the prophets and become part of God's grace in the world. We join the movement of God's long arc of justice, not the God of personal piety, divorced from the pain of the world. Instead, we join God who listens to the cries of the oppressed and acts to release them. Reimagining standing in the tradition of Methodism calls us to our vocation or sacred work, which is conscious action grounded in the experience of God's grace that has us as priesthood of all believers pointing and participating in Christ's redeeming action of grace in the world. <clears throat> Reimagining, therefore, friends, calls us to be humble enough 
to admit that now and then our processes, our structures, our methods, our traditions, our practices as a church need rethinking and review. As it is for any church, it is easy for any church to slip into the entrapments and addictions of the past. At this time of transition, fellow Methodists, this God-given gap that we have, this time when what was doesn't work anymore, and yet we don't know what will be. Now, this gap that God is giving us through COVID-19 calls us to engage in reimagining for our church as a Methodist church. And the good thing about this gap of the was and the will be is that we are all equal in this space. There's no one who knows more than anyone because we all have not been here. And so we start from the same space, all of us, to say, who are we? And if we are the church of Christ, the church concerned about healing and counseling, healing and transformation, what is it that should be our essentials? As a church that calls itself a missional church, what is it in our practices that is a waste of God's time? That doesn't help anybody, doesn't heal anybody, doesn't transform anybody or anything. But we continue to do it year after year. And we spend lots of money on it. Because this is the Methodist church we know. I think we are put by God in a nice space to recreate, to reform, to renew, to focus our mission work on things that heal and things that transform, on things that reconcile and things that save the world, on things that improve our communities and things that change the injustices of this world. That's the reimagination I'm talking about. I'm not talking about moving chairs. I'm talking about a deep, deep, deep looking at ourselves as individuals, as Christians, and as, as the Church of Christ and say, what are we about? And given this space, God is calling us to reimagine. I want to call all organizations of this church. I want to call all sectors and societies led by ministers and the leaders of organizations to this space of reimagination. What is our focus? And what does our focus change in the world? in which we live. <clears throat> now, friends, I believe that reimagining for us as Methodists is to be grounded on our theology. We cannot be a church that does things because others are doing it. I want to commend the work that UCOM has started to do of discussing and talking about who we are, our doctrines and our practices. So that as we begin to do things, we starting from the knowledge part. These conversations and theological conversations, doctrinal conversations, 
are meant to keep us relevant and confident to practice our faith. Allow me to quote an Af one of the African theologians. She says, the work of reimagining is the work of decolonizing our theology and rereading scripture. It is about redeeming the relationship we have with creation. It critiques and reshapes how we build our economy away from the practice that is profit-centered to one that safeguards life, human life and the life of the earth. This reimagining work is the cry of Steve Bantubiko to the oppressed people of South Africa. It is taking back our Im imagination, the reclaiming of our minds, the telling of our stories, because the greatest weapon in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed." End quote. From our theology, we must be able to rethink our practices, to delineate what is essential from what is not. Our practices must get closer to the realities of the poor. If indeed we are, the, we are to incarnate God who sides with the poor, the task of theologians and clergy is to lead and guide these conversations in the circuits and within organization. As a church that exists for the society, we should be able to strengthen our involvement with communities and our prophetic voice and practice shall be heard at all levels. Now friends, All our groupings in the MCSA need to start asking the question, which of our practices is life-giving and which one should be discarded? An example, in the midst of the deadly virus, we need to think how to reshape our gatherings and our events. How should we organize our funerals, Easter services, our conventions, our robing services? The list goes on. Having been an events-driven church, because if you look at our year plans, it's events from January to December, and we gather people Maybe this is the time of moving from being a gathering church to being a scattering church. Because you know COVID has said the church is non-essential in its gathering. You hear that? They didn't say the church must not do its work. They said in its gathering the church is not essential. And so we are essential, not as we gather in big tents and perform and do our, uh, the things that we like. There's nothing wrong with them, but they are not essential. And they don't change the lives of people. They don't heal or transform our communities. But at our, all our level, let's talk about these things because this is the gap that we have been given. With the economic effects of COVID-19, many people losing jobs, poverty rising. There's a need to reimagine ways of maintaining our ministries and our mission over and above member giving. The practice of excluding and embarrassing the poor members, threatening them by not bearing them if they don't give. That practice is not of God. 
and it is to be discarded. While those with the ability to give are to be encouraged to do so, for mission and ministry to continue, it should not be expensive to belong to the MCSA to the point that the poor have to leave because the Methodist Church is for the rich. Reimagine. Over these past six months, many circuits have struggled to meet assessments as a result of our lockdowns and not meeting. Some circuits have closed stations due to the unaffordability of ministry. The need to reimagine another financial model has long been raised in this connection. There is a committee that is dealing with this, and I'm hoping that it will accelerate its work. But as a church, we are being called to, to reimagine the, the models of ministry that are mission focused and relevant to our context. This situation, however, friends, does not need to occupy us in such a way that it consumes us. It cannot be that in all our gatherings we talk assessments. Understanding that we are a missional church that must show and show up in the communities at a time of need, the connection set aside some money, released funds, and said to sacred synods and societies, see what you can do to help the communities where you are and apply, we will give you the resource. The applications are trickling slowly and we are consumed by maintenance matters rather than mission matters. May I encourage, it's not easy, but it is possible with God that we believe in. May we shift our thinking so that our focus is on the mission of God. It is on the healing that needs to take, to take place. On issues of justice, I just want to make a call that our commitment to healing and transformation demands that the issues of justice are taken seriously. Reimagining a better world for all calls us to be a listening church, listening to the voices of the marginalized, listening to understand and not to reply, which is one of the, the shortcomings of the church. We listen in order to, to answer back. Let us listen in order to understand so that we can come alongside with the marginalized and actually um, amplify their voices as they cry for justice. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the moral arc of the universe is long and it bends towards justice. Reimagining demands that we in all our structures or organizations evaluate our participation in the marginalization of some people through our traditions, policies, usages, and so on. And that we become champions of justice. To repeat what I said, during the seven weeks campaign that we had on gender-based violence. A church that is able to reimagine a different world free of injustices, particularly gender-based violence, 
is a church that, is, that openly condemns injustice in the strongest terms and declare it for what it is. We dare not be silent in the face of injustice, whatever culture or tradition dictates. I call on, on all Methodists throughout the connection at all levels to declare in word and deed that gender-based violence is a sin, a sin that violates both the perpetrator and the victim, and it cannot be tolerated. Let our churches become life-giving spaces that model alternative communities where women and men, girls and boys, have their dignity respected. Children and youth. Prioritizing youth and children is critical for the life and the future of our church, especially now. We should encourage them to take our positions of responsibility and leadership in the church. The church should also be serious about giving them space to be who they are and allow them to be innovative and breathe new life into the church. If we do not do this, I'm afraid the work of reimagining will not even begin because our uh, age mates are so used to what has been, but the young ones are able to look in the future. I agree with Alvin Toffler who says these words. The secret message communicated to most young people today by the society around them is that they are not needed. That the society will run itself quite nicely until they, at some distant point in the future, will take over the reins. Yet the fact is that the society is not running itself nicely because the rest of us need all the energy, brains, imagine, imagination, and talent that only young people can bring to bear down on our difficulties. For society, to attempt to solve its desperate problems without the full participation of even very young people is imbecile, end quote. Young people and children have a lot to offer, and therefore they need to be part of this reimagination. The disruption of education during lockdown <clears throat> has caused anxiety amongst learners and their parents. We go into every year with goals, set and expectations. Education has already been a challenge in a society that has so many inequalities along racial, gender, and economic lines. While some were able to continue their studies through online learning, many, in fact millions, were left behind as a church, we need to reimagine what our role should be at this time in the area of education, particularly education for the children of the poor. The, one, the last point I want to raise is the issue of the pandemic of corruption. The level of unemployment in the countries of our connection is out of proportion and COVID-19 has compounded it. The main victims of this state of affairs are young people, young men and young women. And the corruption we see in government circles, private sec sector, and even in the church is adding to the problem. We call on all leaders of the, the governments of the connection to reject and fight corruption in their countries. The connection, as you know, is made of six countries, South Africa, Swaziland, Lesotho, Botswana, um, and Mozambique. And the call is directed 
to all these countries. But for me, the call is to be directed to all those in leadership in the continent of Africa. We hear the cries of the people of Zimbabwe every day as the government there does its own things. We hear the cries of the people of the DR Congo as the government there does its own things. Go north to Mali everywhere. There are conflicts. Those in leadership are leading for themselves rather than for the people they lead. We are seeing in a number of our countries the recruitment of young people to become part of the groups, the, the fighting groups, the insurgents, and so on. It is happening in, in Mozambique. With all of these things happening, we call on the governments of these countries to be people of conscience and to lead as though they lead God's people and to be aware that they are in the positions of leadership for the sake of God's people. But more than that, we call upon all people with conscience, people of faith, to hate corruption. All people who hate suffering should hate corruption because corruption adds to the suffering. I call upon us as Methodist people to reject corruption, however much it offers to us and our families. When, I, when some of us are alleged to be involved in corrupt activities, we don't only get embarrassed, but the message of the gospel is hindered. Message of the gospel is blocked because the people then would say, what is it that they are, they are preaching? How do they condemn corruption when they are corrupt themselves? Methodist people, I beg, let us, let us desist from anything that is corrupt. And so as I end, friends, may we always experience the presence of Christ in and, um, and amongst us. May our resolve to be guided by God's mission be propelled by our faith, deep faith in God who, who gives abundantly. May we use the time we have been given reimagining relevant, just, and graceful ways of participating in God's mission. We cannot do it on our strength, of course. Our strength comes from remembering who we are and whose we are. We are the children of God whose love for all creation spans all ages, all times, all situations to eternity. And it is this God who calls us to reimagine a better world where we will partner with God and bring about healing and transformation. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.